Okay. Um, today's presentation is on designing with pedestrian scale solutions, and it is worth one health safety and wellness unit, HSW CEU. And it's, it's a pretty detailed course on really designed to take anyone of any background and give them a strong knowledge of and a tool set of best practices for designing with pedestrian scale solutions. It may be review for some of you. There may be some new stuff for some of you, but our goal here is to give you as much as you need um, to create some very friendly pedestrian scale solutions. So let's jump into this. And, you know, one of the things that, that we need to dive into uh, before we uh, really get into the primary challenge is we're going to provide some, some fundamental and foundational context and definitions by explaining the what, who, where, and then why. So to start with, what does pedestrian scale actually mean? Well, one definition is site and building design elements that are dimensionally less than those intended to accommodate automobile traffic, flow, and buffering. Another definition is designing the shape, proportion, and detail of a space to create a positive response from people. Pedestrian scale areas are intrinsic to the built environment. For an example, just find an outdoor location where human beings congregate and or travel through such as streets, streetscapes, sidewalks, plazas, etc. Next, who are the main occupants of these pedestrian scale spaces? Well, the answer is everyone. At some point and time, almost every day, everyone will be a pedestrian. If you want to find a pedestrian scale project, look no further than out the nearest window. Where are they? They're in every built environment. So when should you focus on pedestrian scale? Well, when you're trying to connect with a human being at their scale, answer the simple question of, are we designing for vehicular traffic or human traffic? And lastly, why? Why does pedestrian scale design matter? And the answer is because everyone's a pedestrian and more and more people are spending more time outdoors. If there's anything good to come from COVID, it's the fact that it got people outdoors. Also, most people walk at around two to three miles an hour and perceive spaces very deeply and intuitively via multiple senses, primarily with our eyes. This can directly affect one's safety, comfort, and even our mood. When you combine that with the fact that streetscapes, et cetera, make up around 30% of cities and towns, you can quickly see the importance of proper pedestrian scale design. So now that we've gotten through all the W's, let's talk about pedestrian scale as it relates to lighting. Pedestrian scale solutions help bring to life the critical spaces that are defined in our slide before. And if there's improper specification and use of these solutions, it can create spaces that are non-functional, uncomfortable, and most importantly, unsafe. So what does pedestrian scale lighting mean? Well, if we put it simply, we're talking primarily about bollards, building elements, and pole tops. Let's take a moment to define each of these. It's pretty straightforward, but we're going to run through this. Your, your bollards are very ro robust luminaires often found along public pathways and in plazas. They can be used to add structure to a large space and for wayfinding. Bollards can produce either diffuse ambient light or precise directed pathway lighting. And this makes these elements incredibly functional and versatile. Your building elements, these are basically something more architecturally and aesthetically pleasing than a box on the top of the pole. These are large scale luminaires that serve the dual purpose of providing both aesthetic form and functional lighting. They offer many unique shapes and sizes. Building elements provide both structure and wayfinding to exterior spaces of the built environment. Many of these shapes can be complementary between building elements and bollards, which allows for seamless design transition throughout any project. Now, should you want statement pieces built within your pedestrian scale environment, look no further than your building elements. Pole tops, these are lighting solutions that are particularly suitable for illuminating large public spaces. 
These luminaires provide exceptional uniform lighting and can be installed with wide spacings, typically wider spacings than you'll get with your building elements. These solutions provide a great option to ensure the most bang for your buck, while again, maximizing uniformity in any large open space. So now that we've laid the foundation for this, um, let's talk about the challenge at hand here. So our challenge is, how does one use pedestrian scale solutions to safely and effectively address all on-site challenges while building, well, while bringing rather, the design vision to life, not just in the nighttime, but for the life of the project? Keep that challenge in mind as we go throughout the, the rest of the presentation. So to dissolve, <laughs> to dissolve, I'm sorry, to solve today's challenge, we have a few key high-level considerations that we want to consider. First, we have design continuity. How do you effectively ensure continuity in daytime form and in nighttime form? This is by no means a small task. System-driven de designs. How do we solve multiple, ch multiple challenges while minimizing the number of elements in play? That's an equally difficult task. If you're doing a rooftop deck, for example, which is a pedestrian scale space, and you wanna minimize your lighting footprint, how do you do that? And lastly, safety. How do you, you do the previously stated while also ensuring maximum safety and security on site? So to answer all these key considerations, let's first dive into design continuity as it relates to your daytime form. For element design, this is your day form design continuity and for maintaining consistent aesthetics over time, it really starts with your materials and finishes. So we're gonna take a little bit of a shallow dive into these critical elements. When you think about the demands that are placed on exterior luminaires, they really are incredibly high. They're exposed to dirt, various climate conditions, and extreme temperature fluctuations. More than any other luminaires, they also withstand major stresses such as negligence and physical damage. Appropriately selecting the right housing material for your application is a really good starting point. Now this material could be aluminum, could be stainless steel, could be copper, or even wood. Each of the, these materials have their pros and cons. For your exterior luminaire manufacturing and pedestrian scale design, the focus is typically on aluminum as it's the most widely utilized material. It's also the most recycled material on the planet and the most easiest recyclable material on the planet. However, when you're selecting, when you're, uh, your material selection shouldn't stop after you've identified the appropriate housing. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that your finishes are equally important. Aluminum really needs to be protected against the elements in order to survive, and having a high quality finish will ensure the longevity of your project itself and the product itself, as well as the color retention and overall aesthetics of the luminaire over time. So what a manufacturer does with your chosen material when building a product will really help determine the level of your quality, your consistency, and longevity. A high level of craftsmanship can be important when perceiving and are in interacting with any pedestrian scale luminaires during the day, as your luminaires during the day are design elements first and foremost. The point I'm making here is that the potential value can really be accrued when sweating the small stuff in pedestrian scale uh, luminaire manufacturing is critical. One example of this may be the intentional choice to not paint fasteners. If you paint a fastener, inevitably it will be quickly scratched or chipped by screwdrivers or other tools. And if you want even those small components to look brand new as long as possible, finding the right solution or manufacturer is imperative. <clears throat> Typically you wanna have a stainless steel fastener that is not going to rust or corrode over time. Another example of the importance of craftsmanship for any outdoor luminaire, especially pedestrian scale luminaires that will be perceived, interacted with, and scrutinized at a much higher degree, 
is the use of die-cast housings. You really want to take a look at die-cast housings for your exceptional tolerance control. This really ensures that every one of the same product family is identical in scale and quality, that you get your tight corners and line work, and that, that those tight corners and line work can be maintained through the use of high-quality die-cast solutions. Sweating the small stuff is critical to ensure high quality, highly consistent products. Equally important is specifying products with proper surfaceability so that your design remains consistent and cohesive for 20 plus years over the lifetime of the project. A best practice for any luminaire specification is ensuring that replacement electrical components can be ordered and supplied after your warranty periods have expired. So when searching for a manufacturer, <clears throat> look for one who has a, a promise to provide these replacement components for up to 20 years after data purchase. All right, so far the considerations mentioned have covered longevity, durability, and just a little bit on aesthetics for pedestrian scale solutions in day form. Let's take a few more slides to pull on that string and further unravel the aesthetics wool sweater that we're talking about. Many consider this the fun stuff, and this will always be the first thing pedestrians in a space notice. One beneficial option for day form design lighting is using, uh, utilizing something that is architecturally neutral. The goal really is to blend in when required or stand out even if you see fit. Combining a minimalistic approach with a high level of craftsmanship and serviceability really ensures a truly timeless design. The use of architecture neutral designs gives you much flexibility as your design is formulated, finalized, and then built. A successful lighting design, in my opinion, is one that really complements the architecture. It doesn't compete for attention with the architecture. Another definition of a successful lighting design is one that you don't necessarily notice. If you walk into a space, interior or exterior, and you say, this is a beautiful space, I think it's a successful design. If you walk into a space and the first thing you notice is the lighting, it may not be a successful design because you probably don't notice the lighting unless A, you're in the light industry, um, B, it's glary, or C, there's just not enough light. But regardless of what design style you go for, <clears throat> excuse me, having the opportunity to remain consistent is really critical. This is a key key consideration for design continuity, especially in, in, in pedestrian scale applications such as streetscapes, where your unit count may be quite high to illuminate miles of sidewalks, for example. Nothing looks worse than looking down a row of bollards and everyone is pointing off in the wrong direction or not aligned or inconsistently operating. Here's an example of a high level of consistency. The shapes and forms are all consistent and proportional between the different scales of these products. All of these pedestrian scale solutions are designed and built for the same purpose, and that is to illuminate the ground surface. <clears throat> Utilizing these solutions together allows you to maintain continuity of design on your projects while allowing for diversity and appropriate light levels on the ground surface between each of the scales. The scales of design continuity and flexibility are all balanced with your solutions like these. Here you can see many different examples to choose from to ensure your pedestrian application is functional, consistent, comfortable, and complementary of the environment around the product. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of considerations to be aware of when looking to maintain continuity of design in a nighttime scenario. Um, first, we have the quality of light. Light in technical terms is defined as visually evaluated radiant energy. Simply put, this means it's the energy that is perceivable to the human eye between roughly 400 and 700 nanometers in wavelength. This form of energy is what allows us to see and perceive spaces. Whether we perceive that space as comfortable, safe, functional, or on the other hand, cold and unsafe, all depends on the quality of light we use to illuminate that space. For luminaire manufacturers and for specifiers of luminaires like all of you, a major emphasis should be placed on color selection, 
color rendering, and color consistency. Step one is matching color temperatures of your luminaires to each other and to the rest of your site. Cooler color temperatures like 4000K make greens and blues really pop versus a warmer color temperature like 3000K, which often better accentuates reds and oranges. You've all heard of a number of studies that have been done and um, these studies really indicate that in the, the nighttime, the warmer color temperatures affect our circadian rhythm less than the colder color temperatures. So there's a lot of different things to consider when you're looking at what well, color temperature is appropriate for your project. Really, there's never a wrong answer. The choice really can, can create a completely different atmosphere and a disjointed one at that if it's not assigned correctly, as well as a potentially unsafe area where there may be heavier pedestrian traffic like a sidewalk or a plaza. Step two is ensuring that they are rendering colors appropriately. In an outdoor environment, it may not be as critical to render colors as highly as an interior space, such as a grocery store. You know, in a grocery store, you may need to see if your apple is ripe or rotten. However, um, in exterior spaces, it can be very critical for safety anywhere there is human traffic or people congregating together. Step three is ensuring that the color you selected is consistent between luminaires and is consistent from one LED module to another because 3000K can mean a lot of different things to different people. Ensuring consistency at the LED level will ensure consistency across your project. This is all achievable through binning or providing LM79, LM80, and TM30 data. Performance consistency is also critical for a cohesive design across your pedestrian scale project. And what I mean by this is ensuring consistency with light levels, light distributions, and contrast ratios across a multitude of different product types. Finding the appropriate balance of these performance characteristics will create a space that is functional, safe, and comfortable for anyone that's walking along that space. What we're gonna do now is take a look at a case study that showcases just that. And, and this case study is gonna be our reference point for the remainder of the presentation. We'll circle back to this mock application a couple more times as we further define some more con key considerations. But this case study showcases how you can maintain day and night design continuity using different product types of pedestrian scale area lighting. So here we have a large plaza next to a road and a park. And the park is framed by unshielded, bollard, unshielded bollards in a linear pattern that provide ambient light and wayfinding. We'll talk more about what unshielded means in a minute. The light also provides safety so that pedestrians in the area can be easily recognized by drivers on the access road. And the plaza in the front of the building is lit with several light building elements which adds structure and order to this rather uh, otherwise large unstructured space. Guests are welcome to the building, excuse me, uh, with a large staircase that's being illuminated by recessed wall fixtures and ingrate fixtures. And what you'll notice in this design is that as visitors approach the building, your light levels gradually increase. The lowest level of light is measured in the park where the only light comes from the adjacent bollards. Moving on to the road, the light from the bollards adds to some overspill from the row of linear elements that are in the plaza. And the plaza itself is illuminated by the linear elements. This creates a contrast ratio of one, two, three as you move towards the entrance of the building. This is great for creating a sense of rhythm and flow. What I mean by that is if you have one foot candle on your pedestrian walkway in the park, then you have two foot candles in your plaza and three foot candles on your entrance to the building. Uh, this also results in a safe environment for any occupants as the contrast levels are not too extreme to cause disorientation as their eyes slowly adjust to the increased light levels. The use of matching symmetric bollards and building elements also really further creates a sense of balance and unity as the distributions are very similar. And equally as important, when the lights are off and the sun is out, consistency is maintained across all product types in various scales. 
So this now leads us to our next consideration, multifunctionality. We all live in the era of the smartphone and being a one trick pony doesn't suffice anymore. Would you want a phone that is nothing more than a object to make phone calls on? No, you want your phone to access the internet. You want your phone to be able to take pictures and everything else that it does. And we're starting to see this in more and more areas and market demand dictates that more products need to do more things. For designers, this brings some very unique opportunities to solve multiple problems with a single solution. We're gonna take a look at some examples of multifunctionality in pedestrian scale solutions that are available in the market today. And this should allow you to take your design to that next level. Being connected to the internet is really a necessity in today's world. Whether we are in a classroom, a coffee shop, or a park, we're always searching for a way to remain connected. Typically, this need is addressed with Wi-Fi routers placed strategically throughout your, both your interior and your exterior spaces. Now, these devices provide you the required internet signals. They can also be an eyesore commonly found mounted to the side of the buildings or light poles. You know, you all do this beautiful design, design this beautiful project, and then IT comes along and slaps these ugly routers everywhere. In today's world, you can find pedestrian scale solutions that seamlessly integrate the Wi-Fi and maintain the beauty of your design. Your Wi-Fi building elements allow you to incorporate the necessary IT hardware into the luminaires around a campus and this gives you both internet and illumination from a single source. The example you see here showcases a versatile mounting bracket for the access point or router of your choice that's concealed behind a conveniently located access door. And just above this are four integral dual band antennas, which are enclosed by a composite section of housing, which allows a signal to emit most effectively. You can't really put a metal housing or covers around the antenna because that would greatly impede your uh, distribution of your, your signal. This composite section of the housing is finished with the same powder coat found on the metal housing. And this ensures a uniform appearance down the length of these linear elements. You don't even know that it, Wi-Fi exists there, except you have a signal on your phone. The luminar head at the very top also provides general illumination in either symmetric or asymmetric distribution. So now what if in our plaza or streetscape, your design called for floodlights to provide additional illumination at the edges of our building instead of or in conjunction with Wi-Fi? Let's limit your options even further. And what if your client uses these locations as an event space and has asked you not to locate any luminaires where they host guests. Well, this is a perfect time to integrate flood lighting into the building elements that are there being used to illuminate your plaza. Adjustable integral floods can be a fun, unique, and functional means to provide secondary task or, or accent lighting while maintaining uniformity in the pedestrian scale space with aesthetics and ground illumination. It really helps to minimize, again, that lighting footprint or take it to the next level, that electri electrical footprint that you have in your space. So if your design intent is really to focus down on pedestrian scale solutions, then let's quickly discuss multifunctionality options available for bollards. If you're using modular systems like what you see on the screen here, you can, uh, you're, you can um, pick a bollard tube with or without an integral component and pair that with the bollard head of your choosing. So depending on the function you want that bollard to achieve, whether it is GFCI outlets or car charging or a floodlight or battery packs, you name it, um, these systems allow one to maintain your design continuity, your functionality and your safety on site. Let's quickly look at some of these examples. If you additionally need site power for events, maintenance, seasonal lighting, or anything else, these solutions have you covered. Manufacturers can provide a standard GFCI outlet with an additional USB module in both secured 
and unsecured access in modular bollard tubes. In this application, you have um, an opening at the bottom, so you can feed your cables out of that opening and the solution can maintain weather and vandal resistance while in use. If you want to charge your car and illuminate the parking spot or the sidewalk next to it, here on the screen, you can see a viable pedestrian scale option. What's beneficial about system-driven pedestrian scale lighting solutions is a secondary option to be illuminated or non-illuminated while still maintaining design continuity. Uh, these bollards can also be used for food trucks, which is a much cleaner, quieter way to provide power to your food trucks than the noisy generators that are often used. I think you will all love this next one. Um, if you're really looking for something fun and very multifunctional, here is a unique solution that allows any pedestrian or occupant of an outdoor space to enjoy the wonderful lighting and design with a cold beer in hand. This bollard has an integrated beer tap in it. So I'm gonna say this is a bit ridiculous, but I think this really takes the solution to the year 2050 and is the future of pedestrian scale designs. All right, let's go back to our case study now. And if we look back at the case study beyond day form and night form consistency and add functionality into the mix, what happens? Well, depending on the needs of the site, you could easily integrate secondary accessories to solve other obstacles. So what would you do? What other problems can you solve here? Well, for example, you can incorporate Wi-Fi building elements to give connectivity outside the building. If there's parking on the street or near the street, then car charging bollards could be utilized. And should the space be used for events and secondary power, then you can have um, beer taps. That could be a fun and functional addition as well. So this time, I think we've taken the space to the next level. However, none of these enhancements matter if the space is not safe and comfortable to use. So our last key consideration is the most important, and that is safety. We're going to discuss safety as it relates to the proper illumination of pedestrian scale environments and how pedestrian scale solutions can achieve site security uh, beyond just providing lighting. So to ensure your pedestrian scale space is illuminated safely for pedestrians, step one is to identify the appropriate activity level. Since I'm in Colorado here, we're going to reference the Colorado Department of Transportation Light and Design Guidelines, and more importantly, ANSI IES RP818. There are three different pedestrian conflict levels to choose from, low, medium, and high. As a quick reference, low activity levels are for those that have less than 10 pedestrians with an hour of prime time not usage. Your typical examples of low usage would be suburban areas or rural areas. And most of the time, the activity in these spaces uh, and, and at this level is utilized for residential. Your medium activity levels are for areas that have between 10 and 100 pedestrians within an hour of prime time night usage. Examples here would be office areas, apartments, um, neighborhood shopping areas, and parks. Your high activity levels are for areas that have greater than 100 pedestrians per hour. And your typical examples would be your downtown retail areas, theaters, concert halls, uh, stadiums, et cetera. Event centers are the standard term for these high level areas. Now, by identifying the appropriate level, these classifications become a guiding light to begin to prior prioritize and design your space. Hope everybody liked my pun there of your, your guiding light. Um, for example, in a low activity area, glare may not be as much of a concern as meeting appropriate foot candle levels on the sidewalk. However, in a high activity area, like the entry, entry to Madison Square Garden, for example, glare is going to be equal, equally important as uh, minimum light levels. Another example would be looking at object visibility. In your high activity areas, ensuring that at 60 to 70 feet, people can clearly see each other 
And the 60 to 70 feet is the distance when most human beings can read facial expressions. This is critically important. For example, if your friend is trying to get the last playoff tickets at the ticket booth while you're waiting in the cold in anticipation and holding the beer, it can make or break your evening if you see a smile or a frown on their face as they turn to signal you the good or bad news. Simply put, it's really a helpful to, to, tool to identify priorities in terms of light levels, glare, object visibility, and the other uh, items we talked about. So now let's take a moment to talk about one of the most important considerations besides ground level illuminance uh, that this tool will help you tackle and unfortunately which can be deprioritized and or largely ignored, and that's glare or visual comfort. Glare is, um, sorry, I jumped way back here. Glare is, is always a consideration with lighting design. It can be a major concern with the product mounted above horizon of one's eyes, as it can be in the case with pedestrian scale lighting. So let's take a moment just to define glare. And we've all experienced the discomfort of headlights that are too bright coming towards you on the road at night. But I think everybody can also recall other examples that aren't directly in your line of sight, such as an overhead street light that is too bright. Glare is caused by a direct or reflected view of a light source and is perceived as excessive brightness that is uncomfortable. According to the IS handbook, glare occurs in two ways. First, the luminance is too high, meaning there's just too much light for the human eye. Second, luminance ratios are too high, meaning one source or area has too much light when compared to the surrounding light levels. Now, depending on the type of glare it can cause, or type of glare, it can cause a photophobic response like blinking, squinting, looking away, um, feeling uh, a feeling of discomfort, and it can also reduce your visual performance. It's also important to note that glare and its effects differ from person to person, and what, what might be comfortable for one person may not be comfortable for another. To avoid discomfort, fatigue, and even temporary blindness, it's important to avoid and mitigate glare. So in the example that you see here, you can see which angles potentially will cause glare with the observer from direct views of the source. When you're looking at glare and comfort that we saw on the previous slide, it's important to understand your bug ratings. And I think everybody here is probably familiar with bug ratings. I'm not talking about creepy crawly bugs, I'm talking about the acronym bug that stands for buck, <laughs> buck light. Backlight, uplight, and glare. A bug rating will be based on a Luminaire's IS photo, photometric report, and it can be really very helpful for the initial evaluation of backlight, which is also known as light trespass, uplight, which is sky glow, and glare, which is our high angle brightness. Each of these areas now can have a rating from zero to five. Glare is based on the high angle zones ranging from 60 to 90 degrees from nadir or straight down in both the forward and back light directions. Uplight is referred to as anything above 90 degrees from nadir with your low angle uplight from being from 90 to 100 degrees and your high angle uplight above 100 degrees. These are, uh, we're just kind of skirting this, not doing a deep dive into this, but these are really important tools to understand um, when you are selecting pedestrian scale solutions. And in many situations, it, it can feel like a push-pull situation when you're balancing glare and performance. Finding a manufacturer that takes that, a balanced approach to lighting design is really critical. So if you want to avoid glare considerations as much as possible, then potentially a bollard makes the most sense. To start, let's take a look at vertical illuminance. Why does vertical illuminance even matter? Well, your safely lit exterior spaces not only depend on the amount of light and uniformity on the ground,
but also your ability to see your surroundings, including other people in your surroundings. Vertical luminance, luminance helps to provide a sense of boundaries. It gives you visual interest, and it also helps to define the limits of a space. It also allows you to see the spaces of people around you, which is uh, very important. So an as an example, let's consider these three different pedestrian scale bar bollard options that are being used to illuminate a walking path, uh, let's say in a public park. In the first image, you see a fully shielded U0 bollard, no uplight, which provides e excellent lateral throw so you can space your bollards out further. The distribution is very uniform and any uplight constrictions or restrictions are being met. However, for example, of a public park, I would have some concerns about this product selection. Personally, I wouldn't feel safe walking towards this person in a park by myself at night and just being able to see them from the waist down. What would be another way to suggest uh, or another way to approach that we could approach is to provide vertical luminance when U0 is a goal. Well, another way could be to use a U0 pole top or a U0 um, linear element to illuminate the space. Now the bollard in the second image is not U0, but it still fully shields the light source. And what I mean by that is there is no direct view of the light source itself or the reflector from the light source. As you can see, your ver vertical luminance is making its way slightly higher on this pedestrian, almost up to the person's shoulders. Still not the most comfortable if you are in a public park. Um, so the final image on the right, the bollard has unshielded optics, which gives you some up light and downward illumination. This gives you the best vertical luminance for facial recognition. In an application like this, since you are directing some of the light upwards for safety, uh, you will have to space your products closer together. So there's trade-offs that you need to consider. Now there's a time and a place for each one of these pedestrian scale solutions. It all just comes down to understanding how the people will be interacting with your space and what pedestrian activity level you're in, as well as balancing that with any other uh, code or municipality requirements. To fight off glare concerns with a taller solution, there are a number of effective different measures that a manufacturer can take. Um, again, you can, you can recess the source. You don't have your LEDs at your lens level. That helps to reduce your glare. You can use specialized optics for different applications. You can put a, a diffusing lens on a product to help to soften your glare potential. Or you can use some very highly developed um, technical optics, which utilize items like liquid silicone rubber lenses and pure anodized aluminum reflectors in a combination to give you very precise distributions. So now that we've addressed safety consideration as it relates to glare and visual comfort, we're going to look and address at, uh, you know, one of our, our most unfortunate but necessary challenges. There's a number of combination of factors in the world that are influencing the increased concern for safety. And your designs are part of a comprehensive approach to ensure the best experience for all you com your community members. You want them to be safe with lighting. You also want them to be safe um, from um, people who intend to do harm or people who confuse pedals in the car, for example. So how do we do this while also designing an effective pedestrian scale system? Well, an effective solution for vehicular protection and long-term security, your impact rated bollards are customizable for the security needs of your site. You can choose different installation methods, in this case, three different installation methods to protect against vehicular intrusion. The impact bollard tube can provide protection for really any application from bike lanes and property lines to universities and government properties to pedestrian ski, treat skate streetscapes and plazas. These can be discrete solutions that can give you peace of mind and quality illumination while also looking great during the daytime. 
So some of the toughest and most robust installation options for pedestrian scale barrier protection will meet your K4 and M30 P1 requirements. If you're not familiar with M30 P1, this means that your solution will stop seven and a half metric tons at 30 miles an hour with less than or equal to one, me one meter of penetration into that space. If you're looking for a solution like this, um, you know, a lot of people can sit down and do the math, but be wary of certain claims as some solutions claim to have these options that meet these requirements, but usually they're theoretical in nature, meaning they've modeled it, but they have not tested it. To confirm the quality of your pedestrian scale solution, always look for data and testing. As you can see here in this video, So what you have there is a seven and a half ton vehicle that was ramped up to 30 miles an hour. And the goal of that bollard was to prevent the penetration of the load that the vehicle is carrying um, from preventing that space by one meter. And you can see that was a very successful design test. So for the last time, let's come back to our case study and wrap up today's presentation. If we look at design continuity, functionality, and safety, you can now see how your impact bollards could be also used for your barrier protection. You can easily add a couple to the other side of the drive to provide further protection, or you can put a couple on this application near the stairs. You can use diffuse lenses or recessed hidden sources on the building elements, and your bollards could also help with glare. Now this open plaza entryway could solve multiple problems while looking great in daytime form, and in nighttime form, and providing high levels of security to the site. And most importantly, this design can bring um, your design truly to life and brings more people together. And that wraps up our CEU portion of the presentation for today. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Noah. Yeah. No, we did have one question pop up in the chat about um, EV charging. Um, as far as the manufacturer for the different EV vehicles, Tesla, Rivian, et cetera, um, do you specify the, the type of charging and, and things like that? We will supply it with a NEMA 15R receptacle, I believe. I forget the exact number of it. Um, that is suited towards Tesla. But... From what I understand, companies like Ford, Rivian, and others have adapted Tesla's charging um, solution. So it should work with most vehicles if they're compatible with, with Tesla's charging. Gotcha. Hey, Noah, this is Aparna. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I Hi, have Aparna. a question about your uh, uh, impact bollard. Um, are yeah. those lit? And are you currently selling them to EV charging station locations, I guess? So the impact rated bollards can be illuminated or non-illuminated, um, depending on, on how you'd like it to, to be. You can install it to stop up to a hundred and, uh, sorry, a, a seven and a half ton vehicle at 30 miles an hour, or you can install it to stop a pedestrian vehicle at six miles an hour. So it's different levels of installation. The impact rate of bollard is something different. So you can have your car charging or your impact rate of bollard, but not both in the same bollard. Right, right, of course. Yes. The, the bollard yeah. is for, I was thinking about lit, because if you don't see the bollard, then you're more likely to hit it. Correct. Yes, yeah, so it can certainly be illuminated. Oh, and illuminated. And what's the spec for the impact rated bollard? Is, uh, it, is it a NEMA spec or is it a IES it's, spec? Let's see. It is, if you go to, so it's um, M30P1, which is, oh, I forget where that spec comes from, or K4. So that comes from, I think, the Department of, of Transportation. Okay. So this is a DOT spec? I, don't quote me on DOT. Um, oh, Okay. It, it's not NEMA, it's not IES, it's a spec that comes from traffic people. It comes from who? Traffic related. Oh, yeah, traffic industry. related. Yes. Yeah, this, yes. this, yeah, there's going to be a lot of these needed. 
I think. <laughs> you know, it's one of our, our better selling bollards. Fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know. You can look at that either way, I guess. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Very, very illuminating. <laughs> Thanks, Aparna. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Take care. You too. Bye. All right. Well, with that, we will conclude. Thank you, everybody, and have a fantastic weekend. Enjoy the fall weather. <laughs>